vision should be written, a vision should be read. Thirdly, a vision should be run with. Run with it. You write it, you read it to get motivated, fired up, and focused by it, and then you run with it. It must be written, it must be read, it must be run with. You can't open a business and explain something to a person one time and expect them to get it. You have to put it in writing. Put it in writing. You go to an elementary school, there are going to be things to remind the children. You can't tell a child something one time. You have to put all kind of notes around the roll. Be polite. Share. You, you, have to, you have to remind them. They have to see it. They have to see it in order to be it. They have to see it. A vision must be written. A vision must be read. A vision must be run with. And a vision must be received in advance. It must be received in advance. You write the vision, for the vision is for an appointed time. That means that God will give you the vision long before it is time to implement it. God gave Noah the vision to build the ark long before it ever rained on the earth. You do realize that one of the reasons that it seemed so preposterous to people, and people laughed at Noah to no end because it had never rained on the earth. The Bible speaks about it in the earlier chapters of Genesis, how God watered the earth through a mist that came up from the ground. Water had never come down on the earth. They had never seen rain until the time of Noah. So God was saying, I want you to build something, prepare for something that the earth has never seen before. Suppose God gave you a vision to build something that nobody has ever seen before. Don't think that you got to do something that everybody else in the earth has already done. There are some things that have not been hidden from you. They've been hidden for you. And maybe God wants you to start thinking in some dim dimensions. Maybe he wants to show you something that has not yet been done so you don't have to just copy everything. I mean, don't just open up a burger joint and do what McDonald's has done. We got enough McDonald's. We don't need another one of those. I mean, don't, don't just come up with another copycat. Do something else different with a twist on it. You know, be creative. Let God give you something that has a uniqueness and, and trust him. But make sure that you got a vision from God. But understand that that vision, it must be written, it must be read, it must be run with, and it must be received in advance because every vision requires incredible preparation. Vision is what you see. Mission is what you do about what you see. Vision is what you see. Mission is what you do about what you see. Clear mission when you have a mission, because you see, don't have a vision and then don't have a, and then fail to have a mission to carry the vision out. You go into businesses, they have a certain mission statement. A mission, a really, really clear mission answers the following questions. A clear mission says, what needs to be done? It answers that question, what needs to be done? And then it answers the question, who will do it? You have a clear, very, very clear mission. When you, I mean, when you define the mission, they need to know what needs to be done that needs to be answered in your explanation or, or definition of the mission. Who will do it? You know why? Because properly placed people prevent poor performance. Now, I know that's like Peter Piper, pick the pepper, pick the peppers. But properly placed people prevents poor performance. Have you ever thought of it this way? There are no wrong people. There are only wrong places. I want you to think about that for a moment. There are no wrong people. There are only wrong places. And if you do find a wrong person, the only reason that it's the wrong person is because the, the person has been in a wrong environment. You know, there, there are no really wrong people. There are only wrong places. You can take a good child and put them in a wrong place and they become a wrong person. There are no wrong people. There are only wrong places. When your child gets with the wrong crowd, it's the wrong place, and then it can make your child become a wrong person because of who they were hanging around. So there are no wrong people. There are only wrong places. There are only wrong places. And so that's why it's asked the question, who will do it? If you get the wrong person to do it, you, it's the wrong thing and it's, it's not going to come out right. 
you got to have the, the right person doing the job. What, what, what needs to be done? Secondly, who will do it? And the third question, by when will it be done? By when will it be done? When you have a really, really clear mission, when you're really defining your mission, you need to know what needs to be done, who's going to be, who's going to do it, who will be responsible for it, and by when will it be done? But I discovered that people flourish when they're in the right place. People flourish when they're in the right place. And let me just tell you this. Either you've got a vision or you're helping somebody else fulfill their vision. And if you're not, if your vision is not part of somebody else's vision, you end up frustrated in your own life, working in a place for which you are not fit. And it, it keeps rubbing against your soul and you're miserable on a job just trying to have money to keep your utilities on and your rent paid. And oftentimes that happens because we lack our own vision. Because if you had your vision, you'd be in your calling. If you had your vision, you'd be in the place of your gifting. And we'll go and get trained for something for which we are the wrong fit. And you got a wrong person in a right place. But the place is wrong for them because their place is another place. Sometimes the best thing that you can do for people is release them to be in the place where they belong. I'm just telling you, so some of the greatest gifts that you can do is to release some people to be in the place where they belong because if a person is not for you, but if they are with you, but they're not the right one for you, they jack up your life. They make you miserable. They frustrate. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But again, there are no wrong people. There are only wrong places. Because you can find somebody, they didn't work well with you at all, but they get with somebody, they get with their own kind. <laughs> Have you ever just seen somebody, you'd be so glad to get rid of them, it's like you all deserve each other. <laughs> but when you have really clear mission, what needs to be done? Who will do it? By when will it be done? By when will it be done? Now, I want to give you an acronym here for vision just to bring a little greater clarity of this whole thing that we call vision. The V is vigilance, vigilance, vigilance. That means, you know, vigilance is about watchfulness, watchfulness. Watch your attitude when you have everything and watch your patience when you have nothing. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. Be vigilant. You have to be vigilant with a vision. Vision requires vigilance. Vision requires vigilance. Watch your time. I want to give you a few things to watch. Watch your time. So goes your time, so goes your life. Watch your time. Watch your inner circle. Watch your inner circle. Watch your time. Watch your inner circle. Watch your direction. Watch your direction the direction in which your life is moving. See, one inch in the wrong direction is too far. Watch your direction. Watch your focus on God. Watch and see whether pe new people who come into, the, into your life, whether they break your focus on God. Watch your focus on God. Just a few things to watch when you're talking about being vigilant because vision requires vigilance. Vision is about vigilance. You got to watch. Vision, it's, it's, you're supposed to see something, so you have to watch. Watch your money. Watch your money. Somebody said money talks. It always says bye-bye. <laughs> it doesn't have to always say bye-bye. Instead of wondering where it went, tell it where to go. That's what, that's, that's what a budget is for. A budget tells your money where to go. Watch your health. If you got a vision, you have to take care of your body. You have to take care of your health. 
Watch your health. Watch your health. Watch your time. Watch your inner circle. Watch your directions. Watch your focus on God. Watch your money. Watch your health. You have to be vigilant about something. You can be so busy working, 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 working that you fail to be vigilant about your health and your health breaks down or about your personal finances and your finances are in a mess and, and your inner circle and now somebody has slipped into your inner circle and contaminated your world. There are certain things that you have to be vigilant, vigilant. You have to be vigilant. It requires vigilant. You have to watch over whatever you want to happen in your life. Watch over it because vision is never automatic. Vision is never automatic. And please understand this. There is such a thing as a self-fulfilling prophecy, but there's not a self-fulfilling vision. Vision doesn't fulfill itself. You have to work a vision. You have to fulfill a vision. You have to work the vision. You remember in, in Judges chapter 6, one of the qualifications of the people that would be used to go down and, and, and bring deliverance for, for, uh, for Israel uh, among, with, with Gideon, when, uh, as a part of Gideon's 300, what helped him to refine that number down to the 300, he says, take them down to the water. And everybody who laps the water up like a dog won't even look up and say thank you. They're just getting blessed. They just lap. They're just lapping. He says, leave those people right where they are. They're good people, but they're not vigilant. Leave them right there. There'll be other stuff going wrong, and they just. They see the trash in the house that needs to be taken out. They see stuff that needs to be cleaned, clothes that need to be washed. They're just, they're just lapping it up. He says, they're good people, but they, they don't have the vigilance for the vision. So he says, I want you to take a note of people that take the water, and scoop it up in their hands, and bring it to their mouth so they can watch, see what the enemy is doing. He said, I got to use vigilant people. I need people who are aware of their surroundings, aware of the times, aware of changes that's happening in the marketplace. I need people that are aware. I need vigilant people. I need vigilant people. Does that make sense? So the V is vigilance. The V is vigilance. The I with vision means inspired by God. Don't have carnal or self-serving vision. Every vision that is inspired by God, hear me carefully, every vision that is inspired by God is an unselfish vision. It is an unselfish vision that will benefit others always. Every vision that God gives will also involve the participation of other people in order to make that vision come about. If you've got a vision where you don't need anybody else's help in order to bring that vision to pass, that vision didn't come from God. And it tells you immediately that your vision is too small. If you can do your whole vision and it does not involve anybody else being a participant in your vision, it didn't come from God. When God gives a vision, other folks are going to be a, 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 a part of that. So that's the real vision of God. So you need to realize that it must be inspired by God because it serves others and it ultimately brings glory to God when it is inspired by God. Here's the S in the word vision, set time. Set time because every vision is for an appointed time. Every vision is for an appointed time. Listen, don't fall in love with a season because if you fall in love with a particular season of your life, it'll prevent you from being able to move, in a, move ahead. Fall in love with God who will give you purpose fueled by a passion. But vision, vision, the reason that I don't want you to fall in love with a season in your life is because vision evolves. Vision is a living entity. Vision evolves. It evolves. The clarity of many details comes into focus over time. Uh, it's, it's just like a, an embryo that's developing inside of a mother's womb. Remember, it is for a set time. He says, though it tarries, wait for it. Though the vision tarries, wait for it because it is for a set time, an appointed time. You see, and the thing that you will discover is that there is pain in the way, but there's also gain in the weight. There's pain in the way, but there is gain in the weight. 
Though it tarry, wait for it. There is gain in the wait. Yes, it's painful to wait on, on things to happen in your vision. I understand that. I'm a human being. I realize that. It's painful to wait on stuff that you can see. It's painful to say, Lord, when? Lord, when? When am I going to get it married? Lord, when am I going to get the job? Lord, when is the money coming? When is the deliverance? When is the healing going to break through? There is pain in the way, but there's gain in the wait. When you think about it, growth is painful. Change is painful. But nothing is as painful as remaining somewhere that you don't belong. Nothing is as painful as remaining somewhere that you don't belong. So understand that there is a set time. There's a set time for every vision. Don't be discouraged if your time hasn't come yet. That means that there are some other things that you need to get prepared for that you may not be aware of. Here's this I in the word vision is the word isolation. Isolation. Because there is always isolation or separation before there is elevation. God will always isolate you. And whenever you receive a vision from God, that vision will isolate you. I don't care. You can be in a crowd, but the, when you get engulfed in a, in a vision, it's nobody but you in that vision. Vision has an a, a ability to isolate you. Vision is not a group experience. The visionary is isolated by the vision. He or she doesn't even feel like they can always talk to other people without being looked at as though they're strange. And that's why when God gave some people a vision, when God appeared through, by an angel at the well of Annunciation for Mary, the mother of Jesus, when he appeared there, God had to tell her, I want you to go and talk to your cousin Elizabeth. I need to hook you up with somebody so you don't just think that you are just a total nutcase. I need you to talk to somebody else who's got something miraculous in their belly. Don't talk to barren folks who have no vision from God. You got to talk to somebody else that's carrying something because they'll understand your language. They'll know what it is to have something on the inside of them. They, they'll un you need to talk to somebody who's got something that's kicking them and something that they are struggling with because it, 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 it validates you. It normalizes what you're experiencing so that you don't just think that I'm really just, just messed up here. But see, uh, John the Revelator, he was alone uh, in that cave where he received that. Moses experienced the vision of the burning bush alone. Uh, I love something that Lorraine Hansberry says. She says the very thing that, that makes you exceptional is also the thing that generally will make you lonely. And so when you've got a vision and you're focused on it, sometimes it's almost like you don't have a life because that vision consumes you. The O is the word opposition, opposition. Have a vision that challenges you because if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. If it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. There will be opposition. It's not always just the devil. All visions experience opposition. And you'll find that the optimists, they see a solution with every problem. But the pessimist sees a problem with every solution. You have to decide who you're going to be. But there is no opportunity without opposition. There is no opportunity without opposition. Whenever you run into opposition, you must depend upon God to bring a new level of creativity in your life. When you have opposition, you have to become more creative. Creativity is the result of the search for options. Creativity, it is the result of the search for options. It's when you need something that you say, I don't have the money to do that. So guess what? Your creativity has to kick up. You got to kick in. If you don't have the money to do this, you got to learn how to, you know, you have to stand there and say, you know, now what can I do to make this work? You're looking in your house and you know, you don't have $3,000 to buy a sofa. You, you got to say, you know what? If I get these two chairs and I get me some cushions and some piece of fabric, <laughs> you'd be able to put you something together for $275. You know, I'm just, <laughs> anybody know what I'm talking about? And I, I mean, you have to get creative. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. And it just means that whenever you, you know, that, that's all that creativity is. It's, it's, it's the search, it's the result of the search for options. The search for options. Vision immediately says to you that the future holds opportunities for you.
The future holds opportunities. There will be delays, there will be denials that will make you think it will never, ever come to pass. That's a part of the opposition. That'll be something that will say, you know what, I've been believing for 25 years and it hadn't happened yet. Suppose Abraham had said that. There will be delays, there will be denials that will make you think it will never, your vision will never come to pass. But here's the thing that you have to understand as a part of the opposition. Vision leaks. It leaks, it, like it leaks out. You know how you have a, a balloon, you have a party, you have a balloon, you leave those balloons there after a while. They may be at the ceiling one day, but leave them there. Those balloons, the helium will leak out of it and you'll find them coming down. Vision is the same way it leaks. That's why you have to write it and read it over and over again because the impact of the vision will begin to leak out of you. You get excited when you read it, but then over time when you deal with human beings, it sucks the life out of you. You ever know that there's some people that when, after you leave them, you, you, you just feel like your energy is drained out of you? Just keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> but every vision must pass the test of discouragement. And it most often will require the God factor in order for that vision to come to pass. That it'll look like this thing can never work until God steps in and sovereignly and miraculously brings something that helps you to get through a hurdle. And then the end in vision, the final one, is need-based. A vision is always need-based. God will never give you a vision for something that is unnecessary. God never gives a vision for something that is unnecessary. Every vision is born out of a burden. Every vision is born out of a burden. You've seen a need and then your heart breaks. And a vision becomes the answer to do something about a need that you saw and there was a burden that was there. A burden is born out of exposure to a genuine need that you have the ability to do something about. And you have an ability to do something about, God will give you a burden. He'll give you a burden and out of that burden comes that vision. And one thing is sure, that where there is no vision, people perish. My question to you is if your life is not where it, you want it to be or where you feel that it needs to be, could it be that you don't have the right vision? And you can't get your vision from pulling together a committee of people. Vision is not the result of a committee. Vision is the result of intimacy with God because only God knows how he made you. And only God knows the unique gift sets that he's placed in your life and the skills that you have developed. Sometimes people very close to you don't even fully know how you are fully wired. But God knows. And when we get in touch with God and when we pray, when you get hungry enough, you spend the night with God, God will, he'll birth something in your spirit. You'll get pregnant as it were with something that is born of God. And faith is the vision of God. God shows you. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you and guide you into all things and he will show you things that are going to come to pass. God will show you. We are a prophetic people. Heaven is a prophetic place prepared for prophetic people. And when we become this, this visionary people, will we say, God, Give me something that serves you. I'm looking for some of you here today to become like a Hannah. To say, God, I, I, I got a wonderful spouse, but I haven't birthed anything. My relationship is okay, but I, I, I need to birth something. I want to birth something that will serve you. She had an, un, un, an unselfish vision of seeing herself with something that she could conceive and then deliver so that it would serve God and she had to pray that woman prayed like she was intoxicated in the temple they thought she was drunk she was drunk with desire when your heart gets drunk with desire and you go before the king the king of kings the lord of lords God will so put a vision in you 
and if you trust him and if you prepare yourself for that vision that vision will serve other folks God will inspire this thing though it tarry wait for it don't think that God has forsaken you just because you haven't heard from your dream since you got it and because it has not yet come to pass a vision is for an appointed time and oftentimes God is waiting for you to get ready or some circumstances to get ready and some of it cannot come to pass until the fullness of time you're not going to deliver the baby because you are sleepless at night you deliver the baby because the baby has grown full term and all of its systems will be able to then function independently of you God knows when the maturity has come when the release and it was as John the Baptist when John said in John, St. John chapter 3 and verse 30, he must increase and then I must decrease. And the same thing happens with us. God is not going to decrease in what he'll do until we will increase in who we are. He's waiting on us. There has to be a transfer. Jesus had to increase. John had to decrease as this happens. And we have to become just like that. We have to say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to let you rise up here, and I'm going to take the back seat here. I'm going to buy down because I've been trying to figure this thing out all by myself, and I see what I've got myself. I'm going to decrease, God, and I'm going to let you increase. Less of me, more of you. 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 God, I need your vision. I need a divine vision from heaven. I need divine solutions. And I want to pray that God will so fill your life with vision. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.